All right, Sky Squad, we are back in the building. And of course, we are here with Jackson, Mississippi's newest bell, Miss Akisha Holly Cohen. How Cologne. are you? It's Cologne. Oh, Cologne. Let's yeah. get it right, y'all. Cologne. I like that. That's that's sexy here. Yeah, my husband's African American and Puerto Rican, so you know okay. I stole that from him. <laughs> okay, okay. And I noticed that you have your I don't compete, I set standards shirt on. So uh please let the people know that they can get the merchandise as well. Yes, they can. So uh, this is just letting people know, you know, they're seeing me on the show, and it looks like uh what they call me, I'm one up in or <laughs> I'm trying to compete with everybody else on the show. Listen, everything that you're seeing on the show, everything I said, first of all, is my truth. You know, it, it, it only bothers people when they know it's true. And um, so what I say are facts. Now, editing made it seem like I was going tit for tat. But, you know, that's well, actually, you were there when we watched <laughs> episode, that episode. And I am sure you were privy to when the person I was in the scene with said, oh, my God, that scene went nothing like that. Did you remember that? <laughs> I do remember that. Okay. But listen, I'm not here to, you know, tell the mag magician's tricks. I'm a part of an amazing opportunity. So I roll with the punches. And being that I know that I can handle it, so you can say whatever you want to. But um, no, so this for me has always been a mantra of mine. I don't compete. I only go back and forth with myself. So I set standards and those standards, I have to meet myself and anybody else who wants to be, you know, in my circle and around me, then those are the standards they have to come up to. I'm not gonna lower myself to you, you know. In this shirt, it is at Tease of Life. That's www.tease of Life. And all of my merchandise is there. You, if you don't eat on dirty place and all that negativity, <laughs> and jealousy, you can get that one too. But this is the shirt for this week, and it's I don't compete. I set standards. <laughs> <laughs> I don't eat on dirty place. Lord, I don't want no dirty plate either. No. Um, you you talked about uh, I I guess being sort of based out of New Jersey, correct? I, we live in New Jersey because my husband's from my husband is from the New York uh, from the New York. He's from the Bronx in New York, and so Jersey was like our compromise because I'm a Southern girl, mm -hmm. and I um I love New York City. When I first moved here, we were dating, so I had an apartment in Harlem, and I was living my best life. I mean, Harlem is everything, honey, especially if you were in your twenties. But being that I was trying to be somebody's wife, um, I needed to get my ass up out of Harlem. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and he was living in Jersey because the Jets facility, he spent his first seven seasons with the uh, with the Pittsburgh Steelers and his last three seasons with the New York Jets. And so he was living in Jersey. And I just like when I would visit him, I loved Jersey. It reminded me of down south. It reminded me of, of Mississippi and, and Atlanta because I went to college in Atlanta. When I left Jackson, I went to uh, Clark Atlanta University. And Jersey was great because I had Southern living. But when I wanted nightlife, I'm, I'm right across the bridge. And um, when we got to where we were going to be us and we were um, looking to find somewhere we were going to stay because he was getting close to retirement, he wanted to stay in this area because his mother was very sick at the time. And I said, that's fine, but I need some trees. I need some grass. I'm not going to be shoveling snow like I was. Um, so we're going to have to find somewhere where we can get all of that. You get what you want and I get what I want. And so Jersey was our happy medium. And so we go back and forth between New Jersey and Mississippi because my family's in Mississippi. You know, all of my family um, is there. And around 2017, when we were getting married, that was when I introduced Fair Street to him. And uh, well, he had been seeing it when we were coming down, but I was giving him the history and telling him like the things that I wanted to do because we had the property there. And we had been told dreams since I left in 95 of people who were going to come in and do fair street over and they were you know they had this whole project with the uh, company um uh, uh construction uh contractor that they had brought in from memphis at one time and i think some people out of new orleans it was just different people so when i left in 95 fair street was supposed to be done by 2003 well of course that didn't happen and i'm not gonna go through the whole history of that but basically that um you only saw the area where we took you and we went on the tour. Well, you will see what that guy did with the money with Fair Street. He's going to get to another area called Fundren. And mm -hmm. Fundren is a historic white area. Okay. And it's thriving. And it is, it, it's doing amazing. It has a new bowling alley and it has a new movie theater. And it has all these amazing things uh, from the money that was supposed to be set aside for Fair Street. So um, 
from tooth after that, when they realized that that wasn't going to happen, when we got into, um, like I said, my husband and I got together and when we would come down, I would, you know, of course, tell him about, you know, give him the history. Y'all know I'm about running that history. And um, I was telling him about it and he's just like, wow. So when we got married there, most of my guests were from out of town, especially on his side. And a lot of them had never been to Mississippi before. That was their first time being down there. And so I had, um, I wanted to show them what the old Fair Street Festival used to look like. So for my rehearsal dinner, I invited everybody, all of the guests that were invited to my wedding, I had a festival on Fair Street. So the lot that I showed you, remember the vacant mm -hmm. lot we own? That's where I had food and tents set up with all of my favorite foods from Fair Street. So from Jenny T's, from Big Apple Inn, from the fish place, like everything. I had a barbecue place to come in. So all of my favorite foods, and I called it a taste of Mississippi you know, Fair Street style. And then I had live blues bands and all of that. Cause this is when I grew up, when we had the Fair Street Festival, that's what we had. Down. So when I did that to kind of convince my husband, like, Hey, this is where I want to invest. <laughs> so he would understand and he could see my vision because we have in that building that you saw my standing building, we do have a museum that gives the history, the real history of Fair Street. And he had seen that. And so I think when I did that and I had all of our guests and all of our family, um, you know, because my family's from there. So, of course, they know everybody saw it and they got it. And from mm -hmm. that point, um, we decided, OK, we're going to do the bar and do what we're going to do in the Bronx first, because that's in his neighborhood of the Bronx, which is a similar area to what is down south for us. And when we finish that, then we would. Um, you know, we would go down and start on Fair Street. So we started the process at the end of 2017, top of 2018 for the Bronx, because we were in this, I mean, the building, you can see before and after pictures on my uh, social media of what our bar looked like before and after. And we opened 2019. And so I started the process probably the fall of 2019, but I got pregnant. I found out I was pregnant um, when I didn't finish that story, I found out I was pregnant that June 21st. So I had to be very careful with the pregnancy because I was considered high risk. And yeah. so I was able to go back and forth to Mississippi. So I was doing a lot of things um, over the phone and online. And um, then we got to 2020. I had my son February 2020 and COVID hit March 2020. So everything stopped. Everything slowed down. So to all the people, let me just say this and get messy real quick. All y'all that are saying... Oh, you're taking so you took somebody's idea and you are doing this fair street thing because you're on the show. Sweetheart, I've been doing this fair street thing my whole life. This was in the process before I even knew anything about this show, before I had ever met any of the girls from the show. Um, and that's that you'll find that out as you watch. And if you don't, I don't care. But this is the process of how we got to where we were. So all of 2020, everything was shut down. 2021 is when things began to open up and is when I started back the process, got my renderings done and we we did uh, where we are now. Uh, and it's changing a little bit now because I was just really focused on my my uh, the land I owned, but I realized that what is happening now is bigger than me. So I can't just focus on my land. We need to get that entire block done. Yeah. So um, I'm submitting a proposal with the group that I have, the Holly Cologne group, and we're submitting a proposal to the city of Jackson and the JRA, which is the Jackson Redevelopment Authority, to do the entire project. Well, I hope you guys do get a chance to like really get into the nitty gritty, because I understand now that you're saying that there was another area that got revitalized. <sighs> Yeah, because no, and I mean, if any, listen, if you know anything about the history of, of black folks, then you know how it happens. And that's just what it was. They, he came in, he was going, they were going to do all this stuff for Farish, but he was pushing the money into another project. Which and is crazy to me. And the thing about it is I, I was like very adamant. I was like, I need to see Ferris Street. So yes, you somebody, were. somebody <laughs> better get this sprint van over to, to yeah. Ferris Street. Because I also felt like, you know, it's been a through it's been a through line for this series, you know, since the beginning. And mm -hmm. it's been a through line for you even since before the series. So as all of you uh ladies converge with these with these amazing ideas to walk down the street and to also feel the history. I think it was important for at least me, I know, um, yeah. to understand what's here and what's possible. And to see it, it's like, oh, this, 
why haven't why hasn't anybody done anything with this? This is like this is easy. Yeah. This is easy. It's well, it's not I easy. I mean, it's easy to see it. You know what I'm saying? To see the vision of what it could be. Yes. So what's the I mean the hold up? Like what what are we doing? Why well, are we wasting oh, time? I, a lot of those buildings, except my property and um maybe one of the properties in the block that you saw, they're all owned by the city now. The city had to go back in and sue that guy to get the property and their money back. And so that lawsuit, like when people keep on saying, well, what's taking so long? Your family been down there doing whatever. Well, if you go by my building, my building is one of the only that are, that's renovated. You saw the Alamo Theater that's renovated. Mm -hmm. My family helped in, in pushing along that process. So we don't, we don't own anything else down there. And it was nothing that we could do to it until the city was able to obtain the property back. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's throwing out this and that because of what you see on the show, all this is public record. You can look up any of this, but what I own, you saw, and it, it, it's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think that's the thing, like to see, I guess it's easy for me to see the vision of what it could be. And it's yeah. so hard to believe that like, like this, yeah. this is well, like that's really magic what, right here. Yeah. That's really what the process has been. The city suing this guy for what was taken. Gotcha. And that just, I want to say that just ended maybe last year. It was either the end of 2020 or 2021. And mm. uh, I mean, that's something that we can look up, but that just happened. So now the RFP was released on August 1st for all okay. of those who want to know what I've been doing. And RFP is a request for proposals. Okay. City is requesting for proposals of people who want to buy buildings who want to come in and redevelop. So my proposal, I sent in a proposal before this because I wanted to put my unsolicited proposal in just so they know what I had in the works. And now I am resubmitting the solicited proposal with the guidelines under the RFP. Okay. Because okay. Originally, I didn't even care. I was like, well, I'm going to come in. We're going to do what we're going to do down here. We're going to bring our second location to Bricks and Hobbs. And that's what you see on the show. But as we've gotten through these last months, so, I mean, we finished filming a while ago. And like I tell people, my ancestors have been riding me. They've been on me. When I'm on Fair Street, when I walk up and down the street, I, I feel them just pushing me along. And over these last couple of months, I talked to Willie about it. And I said, you know, after this show and just being down here, we're gonna, I'm ha we're gonna have to do something else. I'm gonna have to do a little bit more. Mm. And um, I got a couple people in Jackson, uh, who uh, two of them own property down there as well. So they're invested in the area, and so they want to see it happen. And um, we just came together. We brought our resources together and brought our ideas together. And we came up with a proposal. You see a little bit of my idea. I mean, as the show go on, you'll see some things. Um, but I just think that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I've never in my life, Richie, felt like I was walking in my purpose as I do since I've been doing this the last two, a couple of years. Mm. And I think that I cannot wait to see the evolution of it just as somebody who was able to walk down the street with you. You know what I'm saying? Um, I want to go back to something because I recall... <laughs> You mentioned it when I when I met you, but mm -hmm. then I recalled actually reading about you in and because I, I had to go back reading about your name being kind of tossed around for oh. the Housewives of New Jersey. Yeah. Can you talk about how that process went and what made you go another way? OK, um, I was somebody sent the information to me or whatever, and. Um, because I was up here and I, like I said, we go back and forth to Mississippi. Um, I, I saw it and they were like, oh, I think you would be perfect for this because they were saying, uh, uh, I think it said something about 
professional, like boss women, people who uh, were taking care of their households, who were running their businesses, who were doing all these things, which is, you know, what I do. Uh, they said I run off my resume. Well, then, I mean, I do a lot of things. So at the time, you know, I'm running this bar. I'm a, a wifeager. You know, I manage my husband's radio and television career. Uh, I do the stuff that I'm doing for myself. I'm vice president of the Holly Foundation. So whatever we have on uh, Fair Street. So it was just all this stuff. And I was like, girl, you want me to add? I said, but you know what? This is another platform. So let's see. Well, when I began the process, I did not know that it was that show. I, I didn't know that. I just know that I was in, you know, it was New Jersey and they I can still do my thing going back and forth. And um, as we got to like maybe the second interview when I was talking to my, she was like, oh my God, I love you. Da, 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 da. She was like, you do know what this is for, right? And I said, no, because there's so many things that pop up, you know, and there's so I many know. shows coming out. So, you know, I mean, I just didn't, especially I didn't know it was for that and I'm black. So, y'all, you know, the way the conversations were going, clearly I, it wasn't that. <laughs> you know, so when she said it, I said, oh, shit. <laughs> what? And she said, yes. And then it brought me to the fact I knew that they were thinking of doing something because that's when Ebony had just been introduced as the new one in New York. The oh. first, you know, people say, I know the first. Well, I do know the first, honey. The first, <laughs> a lot of things. And so uh, my sister had just gotten, you know, had been out here like she's going to be the first housewife in New York. And so, uh, of course, I call I'm like, hey, let me, you know, because I had met her through a mutual friend. Um, oh, my God. Through a lady who is and you talk about a social light in New York. That's I'm, I can't. I mean, I'm an amazing lady. And I she introduced me to Ebony and Ebony is just everything. If anybody. I know. The, I know. I know. I know. Yes, everything. And uh, she was just so just positive and I just loved her energy and I just love hearing her talk, you know, and um, and we just got along. We just vibed. I mean, we we are similar in a lot of uh, areas. And um, so I hit her up and I was like, yo. This, you know, and she was like, oh, wow. So, you know, she was talking me through the process, telling me, you know, this is that. But guys, I was pregnant with my daughter. Mm. So going through this process and I was at the time maybe five months pregnant, five, you know, six months pregnant. So I still had another three and a half months or so on this pregnancy. And then they were going to be starting to film like that fall. I was set to have my daughter in July. I had her July 13th. And then everything was going to be set, you know, after that, around that time or after. And so I still continued to go through the process, but I was very hesitant. Well, at the same time, because of whatever everything that was going on with Fair Street, I think Bell Collective came out the top of that year, maybe February, January, February, March, whatever it was. And so I started catching up on the show around February. You know, like I saw that it was coming out, but I had never, I didn't watch the complete season until a little bit after it was done. Yeah. And I was like, I was so excited about Bell Collective. One, because it was my city. Like, I'm from Jackson, Mississippi. You have you know, women down here, you're showing that, you know, even the, the drama and whatever they had going on in there, people just have this perception of people from Mississippi. And so they were showing women, one I knew, which was Tamara, because she went to my high school. She's a couple of years behind me, but she went to high school with me. And then the others I didn't know, but I was just like, oh my God, they're highlighting Jackson. And then I see this young lady saying something about Fair Street. So I was like, oh, wait a minute, like, you know, I have whatever I'm going to be bringing there. And if she can put this show, I mean, put this, the street on the show, that's going to be bringing more business. That's putting it, that's just, it's going to be great for everybody. So I called Tamara and I call uh, my, Melanie. Melanie's actually on the show. And Melanie and I, um, it's funny, we're both from Mississippi, but we met in Atlanta. Melanie was at Spelman when I was at Clark Atlanta. Okay. And, yes. And so we met there and just stayed in touch over the years because and um, she did some things for me and PR. Like when I would come back to Jackson, if I wanted to do a party, if I wanted to do things, when I did community service projects, I would always reach out to Melanie or Tamara so they could get the word out or let me know who was, the you know, who was doing what there at the time. Because I, you yeah. know, I wasn't living. I only come in and out from my family. Yeah. And so I would reach out to them. So anyway, I called Melanie and I called Tamara and I said, hey, I want to meet the young lady who's talking about Fair Street, because I want to see what she has going on, what she has in the works and see, you know, maybe we could, um, I could help with whatever she's doing and whatever business she's bringing. I just want the foot traffic down here. We need to get this street back. 
looking at that, I'm seeing her walking down the street and she was talking about buying the block back. And I was like, oh, maybe she's talking about that other block because that block behind you, that's mine right there. <laughs> <laughs> that little part, that back there on that left side. Yeah, that's me. But, you know, maybe, you know, I'm just no, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But no, I was, just, I was excited. And um, so I ended up talking to her on the phone and she just had a lot of energy to her and, you know, was saying like, yes, she was talking about the things that she had gone through and uh, what was happening, which I understood that because a lot of, like I said, a lot of people didn't know. And it wasn't like the city was sharing what was happening with this lawsuit, but it still was public information. So that's just a matter of you doing the research on your own. So people were hitting these roadblocks one, if you if you don't have the resources and the know to like the people in there, it, that can be a roadblock. Um, financially, you you know you got that can be a roadblock. Um, it's just different reasons why you can be stopped. And at the end of the day, I mean, it's a lot of um, it's politics and the people in there that are running the city. So you know you just have to be able to know how to maneuver that. Yeah. And so she was talking about the things that were happening with her. And she said, well, you know what? We weren't able to see any of the buildings. You know, do you think you would be able to do a scene with me? Or if we could do a scene, if the show comes back, because maybe we could see your building. I'm like, hell yeah, because then that's putting out my museum on up, um, the map. This is own we're talking about. This is one of the mo the best African-American, I mean, not just African-American, but I mean, a lot of our people are drawn to this network. So I was like, heck yeah, I'll do a scene with you. And I'm going to be able to put this museum up, um, museum up. I'll be able to highlight what I'm about to do with my restaurant. This is all that's going through my mind. So she calls whoever, and then she calls back and says, they've already heard about you and they want to talk to you. And I said, okay. And so she said, well, I know that they're thinking about bringing new people in. And so, you know, whatever. She was like, I like you. And um, I ended up talking to them. And so when I started talking to them, then that's when it was becoming sort of like a reality of like they wanted, you know, were um, interviewing me to be on the show and my husband. And so I was thinking about the other, what we started this conversation about, thinking about the other opportunity possibly. And I was thinking about this opportunity. And for me, I don't know where that would have gone or if I, you know, if I was even going to be selected. But I know that when I thought about Fair Street, when I thought about my story, uh, when I thought about the history of my family, I knew that Carlos King and Kingdom Reign and Own would definitely present it in a way that would be pleasing to me and even my ancestors. Because not that you have a whole bunch of control, but when you have someone like Carlos King that listens, who is not just trying to come in to give you reality TV and, and tear you down. Um, and I just knew that this particular network was going to show this story the way it needed to be shown. And, and it, they were going to feature it and highlight what needed to be highlighted and tell the, the correct history of it. Mm. And um, I just thought that it was going to be a better fit and a better match for me and what my goals are for the area and what my goals are mm. just in life. I definitely 110 percent agree. <laughs> and yeah. we will we will leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> I just yeah. think that this is this is the better fit, yeah. not only for your personality to shine, but also for what it will allow you to do that you are naturally already doing. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a better fit. Um, I want to talk just a couple of things about this show really quickly. I mean, obviously, we know that the scene with you and Marie was <laughs> it. It to me, I laughed both times. It I was saw funny that. to me. I mean, it, it was funny to her. You saw it. And I was just like, oh, oh, okay, oh, you know. <laughs> I'm watching it like a view of myself because I'm like, shit, wait a minute, that didn't happen. But it put it took me out of being in the scene and being able to enjoy the show. So I, I honestly have a friend of mine who called me yesterday crying, laughing because she had not watched the episodes yet. And so she was watching yes. and she literally stopped everything she was doing to call me. I just gotten out of the shower. She called me. She's dying laughing <laughs> at you guys. So that it's just a testament to how much good TV y'all make. I want to talk about the brunch for one second. Like, oh boy. Uh, give me your thoughts as you as walk me through the brunch, the dirty plate, the argument for from your perspective. And okay. how long did it last? 
It was forever. Child was forever. First of all, we had been waiting outside for like two hours or something to even get up in there. So that's probably why that food burned. I'm not going to even put that on her. I think, but maybe, you know, it was your brunch. Me, I'm such a micro, you know, like when it comes to something that I'm presenting. So I would have been like, I need y'all to turn them sternums down because that's going to be, you know, but that's just me. I'm nothing against her. I'm not saying that, but I do enough events that I'm always looking and on top of everything because I know each event I do it represents me and you're only as good as your last event. Like for me right now, I just threw my daughter's first birthday party. Anybody who came to that, that's what they're going to remember. They're not going to remember Cologne Classic the, the year before that because I do the Cologne Classic every year. But what I'm saying is, so I, each event I do, I want to make sure that it is the best because one, you never know if you're going to get to throw another one. And that's the last thing that people are going to remember, just to say that. So coming to this brunch, and this is my truth. Because one thing about me, I don't give a damn about a show and anything else. I do not lie. Period. Because I answer to a call and way above here. So if y'all asses don't know if I'm lying or not, I know who does. Let's just get that out there. I had no intentions of coming in here, ripping up this, this brunch. Those were not my intentions. I mean, I had seen pictures of brunches before now people say oh well you had seen last season you saw how they went well what you guys did not see is a scene between Letitia and me by ourselves in my office on Ferris Street they didn't put that in there for whatever reason and this is where she actually invited me to the brunch we walked up and down Ferris Street and she invited me to the brunch and I asked her I was like now wait what kind of brunch is this gonna be because I'm thinking like now you allowed them to show some show uh, some brunches on TV which I wouldn't have done that because in fact, she told me brunches were her wheelhouse. Like this is what she does. So I don't even care if we're on television. If that's what I know is my business, I'm not going to let television, production, and anybody else mess up what is my business. Now I'm going to give y'all some drama like the stuff I did, but you're not going to mess up my bit. You're not going to mess up what is supposed to be my, my thing. Right. So we had that conversation. So I was like, oh, okay. Well, I had been invited to Tisha's brunches way before the show when she was having them. I had seen pictures of her brunches. Um, Melanie had told me about them. Tamara had told me about them. I follow her on social media. She had a um, she had an Instagram for actually her brunches. And so I was really excited. Anything that's bringing Black women together where we can come together and network and help each other out, I'm all for it. Period. I don't care how I'm presented. I am for that. And anybody who's worked with me or worked for me, they know that. So I'm like, oh, well then, you know, maybe she took that advice about the brunches and they're really going to come together and put something together. So, like I said, we get to the venue. I do know the venue. I know the owners of the venue. Their children went to school with me. So I, I, I do know the venue. <clears throat> so I'm like, oh, we're having this at so-and-so, so-and-so at this place. Okay, this is nice sitting in the car. We're waiting. We're waiting. We're waiting. Of course, there are things you have to do. You drive up, all this kind of stuff. Well, when we came in, now this is my bad. I said out loud what was in my head because I walk in and this room, I was considering having my reception at this place. So I know it holds. All the reason I didn't have it is because my reception was bigger. They hold about 250 and I needed a place that hold, held over 300. So I'm like, now this place holds 250 folks. This what <laughs> what I and, and I that came out because I was like, oh, I thought this was gonna be bitch, you might. So be quiet. Like this girl is like, oh. <laughs> and so that now that was my bad. But when I sat down, I'm like, okay, I keep should get in the moment. Yes, you got dressed up for this. You know, you thought you were coming here to meet some people in the city of Jackson. That's not it. We're going to meet the rest of the cast. Because I had not met, uh, only people I had sat with before that was Letitia, Marie, and Tamara. So this was my introduction to uh, Gucci. I had met Miss So Gucci before. Um, I had seen in Jackson uh, Latrice, but, you know, this was really my formal introduction there. And uh, Miss Essie and uh, Pila Hatch's finest. You know, I didn't even know they were coming. So, all right, that's fine. I'm not a person to come in and be like, oh, whatever. But I'm, I did. I, I, I skimmed the room. It's, it's, you know, twelve o'clock, one o'clock in the daytime. 
even, you know, sequin tablecloths are my thing, but usually people do that at night if they, you know. So I'm like, okay, all right, here we go. I'm here to support because I had met this girl. We had things, you know, common goals, commonalities. I'm going to be, well, we start and she comes in and we talk, everybody comes in. When we got ready, they said uh, we were going to get up to get our food. I'm starving. I've been here about three hours now. So I'm like, oh, okay. Well, when I sat down, I mean, when I got ready to get my plate to get up, I saw my plate was dirty. I turned, there's a producer behind me. And I forget that you're not, to, they're not there in, in the reality of things. They're not there right. because of the TV show. But I just, I'm not thinking. So I was just like, my plate is dirty. You know, I said it. To her. And so she said, I am not, do not tell me. You tell her. Like, basically, and I was like, oh, shit. Because in my mind, too, let me just remind a little bit. That scene that was so fiery and that was good and you y'all talk about with me and Marie, that actually was a boring scene. And I was told by production that I needed to kick it up because they were like, we need to see the person we interviewed and you are being a little nice in here. And I was like, oh, well, I wasn't trying to come in wrong. So that's why I think maybe that scene was put together like it was because actually I was told and um, there's another Belle who was there and heard them tell me that if she would admit to it, I don't know and I don't care. But so I was getting a little like, I got to get myself together, girl, you're on reality TV. So that's why when I said that to the producer and she kind of got me together again, I'm like, all right, Akisha, you messing up. Like, come on. <laughs> so I walk back over. I go over to Letitia and I said, excuse me, Letitia. I said, my plate's dirty. And what is not seen is she looks and she said, what you want me to do about it? I didn't put this together. And I said, I just looked at it because who, who you talking to? <laughs> so I, I was like, oh, I said, well, it, you're the host. It's a brunch, isn't it? And so she goes into this whole thing of like, and that's what it happens. And da 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 da. And it's like, go. So I go. Now you don't see that, but you do see me come back and sit down. And you see me sitting with my legs crossed. And they're like, oh, you're not eating. I said, well, my plate's dirty. So no, I'm not eating. Because that's why she and I had kind of passed words. <laughs> like, I'm about to go off. And I and I said, well, go off on who? Because <laughs> I'm confused. So I sit down. I sit down. And that's when I think she may have gotten kind of gotten it together. And she comes over. And that's where you see the scene pick up. And she's like, oh, well, let me see your plate. And I'll, you know, well, let me get that out of your, you know, kind of being condescending, you know, like, well, let me take care of this for you. Because I don't want you to have a dirt, you know, that type of thing. So I'm already like, oh, okay. So now you try, you're trying to do me. <laughs> uh, now, now I see where we are. Because I, and you will see. As the season goes on, because I'm not going to tell, she does explain where the, that attitude came from. Because okay. at this point, I'm totally confused. Like, you invited me here. You asked me to come to your brunch, honey. I didn't have to. I had plenty of shit to do that day. I mean, just to be real with you, there was things that were lined up after that. I didn't know we were going to be there for that amount of time, especially waiting two to three hours to even get into this place. So... As we said, and then I go, when I finally get the plate, y'all do see that. Then I go over to the food. They kind of zoomed in a little bit. I picked the waffle up. If you looked at that, the bacon was burnt. The bottom of that was burnt. I'm like, you got to be freaking kidding me. I'm in here starving. We've had this whole fiasco about this damn plate. And now I can't even eat none of the food. And she's saying, well, you're the only one that felt that way. Well, girl, of course, these your friends up in here. They ain't about to tell you that this shit is garbage. <laughs> Because she's like, I scanned, I went over the room. I think y'all saw that in the scene. And nobody else had the same sentiments. Okay, well, then maybe they were eating out of a different pot or something. I don't know. I'm just telling you, I wanted waffle, bacon, and eggs. The waffle, my waffle was burnt, and the bacon looked burnt. I don't eat it that crispy. And so I just, I didn't want anything. Because I, then I was also kind of feeling some way by the way she responded. Mm. And so I sit down, and she stands up which is, this is not seen. And this is why people want to know where the name, how this other part came into play. She says, so guys, Aikisha, um, everybody know uh, people, you know, I'm from Pelahatchee and Aikisha's cousin used to be the mayor of Pelahatchee. Again, another first in my family. She was the first black mayor. Let's just put that out there. So I'm like, oh yes, I was just like, yeah. Well, 
I hear to my right, mm, I'm, that's unfortunate for you. And so I, I said, no, no, no. She said she was the mayor, the first black mayor, woman. Um, that's Those are applause. And she was like, oh, well, I don't know if she was like, I don't, I don't do, uh, she said my cousin's name. I don't do so-and-so, so-and-so. Well, sweetheart, if you don't do her, then you don't do me. So it's no reason for us to talk. Because what we're not about to do on national TV is talk about my family. I'm not doing that. So when you hear about the Pelahatchee Posse, that's where that came from. So when I think oh. back, how I feel like I was set up because you knew that your friends did not like my cousin. You knew that. So why did you announce in this brunch that my cousin was the mayor and you knew that you and your friends did not like my cousin? Why? Well, you know what? Now it makes sense when you say you felt attacked in the show because that was in there. You said you felt attacked by the Pilahachi Posse. Now it makes sense because we didn't see it on the screen and probably because it was just a lot of other, it was a lot of chaos. And I mean, they, they were buttoning in and coming in and that they weren't showing them on TV child. It's showing about y'all. So, <laughs> but I mean, I'm happy to bring relevance to them. Now, don't get me wrong, honey. I love Pila Hatchie. I don't have anything. Against, my family is in Pila Hatchie. That cousin you're talking about, and this ain't no play family. These are Hollies that are in Pila Hatchie. So it wasn't like, I, I definitely want to clear that up because I don't want anybody from Pila Hatchie thinking like, oh, I was coming for them, or I think I'm better because I'm from Jackson and all that. That had nothing to do with it. That had nothing to do with the, the town of Pila Hatchie. That, Pila Hatchie is an amazing place. That was more of me. That that was to that little, that, that, little, that group right there. <laughs> okay, so listen. Before we go, because listen, I, I cannot wait to talk to you at the back half of the season, like as we get closer to the reunion, because I know I'm going to have some more questions because you, <laughs> you gave us a lot today. Um, anything that you are that you can tell us about, we know that there's some upcoming stuff with you and Letitia and even you, it looks like you and Tambra, like, um, can you tease us with any little thing that we need to watch out for in the next couple of episodes without giving too much away? No, I think the brunch is a great setup for what's to come and even our conversations and those in, in, in the interviews. I mean, I'm watching this. You guys have to realize I've only seen, I only saw episode one and two. So I'm watching like y'all, I have no idea what, how it's set up. I have no idea with editing. I, I watch this just like you do. Like I'm not in it. And I enjoy it because like I said, I put a post up after that for my debut episode because people were, you know, they had their opinions of me and that's fine. That's neither here nor there. I'm not going to come on after every episode to defend something you may or may not like or think I said or think I'm like this or who you think I am. I'm just not in the business of defending myself um, when I know who I am and whose I am. Um, so I enjoy it. I am enjoying this show. I trust me. I, I, you know, it's just, you guys are going to see, I will say a lot of things will begin to unfold and this onion is definitely going to start unpeeling. And, you know, you may or may not like me when we get to the end of it. And you may or may not like somebody else. Like, I mean, I, who's, who, I don't know. Uh, but I just, I will tell you this, keep watching because it's going to get juicy. Uh, it's just, you know, now when I see what they've done with these first three episodes, I'm I can't wait. Like I have to travel on Friday, so I'm not gonna be able to see it when it comes on because I'm going to Mississippi. Actually, I I just I'm like, oh god, I don't I I gotta I'm gonna have to get this on my app. I gotta make sure on the plane, you know, because <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's gonna get good. Well, I definitely say that is a very healthy way to watch, be in the show and then watch it, and then just enjoy it and take it with a grain of salt. Like, yeah. I always tell people, leave it all on the show. Period. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 and don't bother, you know, with defending yourself, because I feel like, I always tell people, if you just, if you stay that same person throughout your course of time on television, people will gravitate towards you because it's real. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'll say one piece of advice I got from one a producer um, who told me, just continue to be your authentic self. Because what happens is the truth will always, I mean, it's so cliche, set you free or whatever. My truth is my truth whether people like it or not. And the people who are involved in this, they know what is true and what is not true. So, you know, I mean, I, of course I have people who love me and I go and I'll react because I try to stay out of the comments, but it's just certain things that I see on there that I just have to read. Like, it's funny to me. And I go and listen, I like everybody's stuff because I like the fact that you're watching. Even for you to say you don't like me, you had to have watched the show. So I'm like, thank you. Thank you for watching. I appreciate that because I know what my truth is and they do too. They know what they've gone on the show and, and given their real about, and they know what they've gone on the show and lied about. And, you know, same with me. I know that I, my truth, I know what's true. And so I'm going to stand in it. You know what I, I do going back to that day and watching that episode, I got to tell you, it was some of the best TV. Like you, you came in and they, what I love that they did with your character is, well, I mean, you just you as a person, they they had you come in guns blazing. No. <laughs> and then episode, your next episode, this past episode, we get this, you know, a backstory of your conception process and how difficult that was. And as I scroll through your Instagram and I see the joy reflected in all of your pregnancy posts, you know, can you just tell us a little bit about, you know, I, I want to touch on that before we get into any other thing, because I felt like that was such an important part of your story. Um, well, first of all, to God be the glory for that, because I always said that whatever platform I had, um, and not including any show, but my husband and I had a platform before the show, um, I was always going to give God the glory and share my story because I met so many people along the way that I did not know, or I never even imagined that this was going on in people's lives, um, having problems conceiving. I mean, I knew, you know, people have, I knew IVF was out there and, and people had issues having babies, but I never for one thought that would be my issue. I just mm -hmm. thought when I wanted to get pregnant, I would stop trying and then, you know, I'd be able to have a baby. And which really what was happening, I stopped trying and I was getting pregnant, but the pregnancies weren't holding. And mm -hmm. so that's when I had to go through the process of educating myself on, all right, what's going on? Why are they not holding? What's happening? I knew that I was past, you know, what they call now geriatric pregnancies. Anything over 32 or 35 is considered a geriatric pregnancy. Um, but I didn't know about ov ovarian reserve. I didn't know about freezing eggs. I mean, I'd heard of it, but it wasn't anything that anybody around me or in my community was doing that I knew of. Um, I didn't know what FSH was, which is your follicle stimulating hormone or your AMH and all of these things that I found out over a five year process of Willie and I trying to have a baby, trying to conceive. And when we were conceiving, why was I losing? What was going on with my body? What's going on with my eggs? Why was my body, I had an FSH of 56. 56 is a person who's menopause. And a, a good FSH for someone in their 20s or in their teens or 20s trying to have a baby is anything under 13. Mm. You can do, um, you get into your 30s, you may be from 10 to maybe 15 or 16. Even where I was, you, uh, some IVF clinics will take you up to 22 with an FSH, and then you have those that'll push it to 25. I just told you I had a 56 one time. I had they were in the 30s, and I had I just had no understanding of what was happening and why was it happening. You know, biologically, my mother, there's six of us. My sisters, all of my sisters had children, and. Unfortunately, my mother had already passed, so I wasn't even able to go to her to get the history on if she had miscarriages, if there was anything wrong. Because, you know, that's those are things that we talk about. And definitely we don't talk about it in our community. When I went there, some of my white friends were like, oh, yeah, I froze my eggs when I was in my 30s. I mean, you know, when I was 30. Oh, I started freezing my eggs when I was 27, 28. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> Is 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 that something that is 
Is that I mean, and it, it, when you say, especially with your with your white friends, I, I just wonder, is that something that's like more talked about in the white communities than it is in you, black communities? Because I feel like this is not something I'm hearing people talking about at that young of an age. Listen, you know, they want to talk about me talking about the first and everybody in my family did this and did that. Well, hell, they did. And I'm going to say this. I grew up in a household where my aunt adopted me, my father's sister. She is a physician. She was the first African-American anesthesiologist in the state of Mississippi, the first black uh, woman and then the first black woman. So that was her. I had I, my grandmother live with us. My grandmother was a registered nurse. She was. And how with people who knew medicine, who knew the body, who knew the process of life, we never talked about fertility. Wow. That it, it, it's just so I don't know. I also, I will say there were so many women in each fertility clinic that I went into, all races, creeds, colors, ages, but there were not many of us. And I don't know if that had to do with the finances. Um, it's just sort of this thing that we don't talk about. When you have problems and, and it's an issue getting pregnant, it's embarrassing for us for whatever reason. And it shouldn't be because it was embarrassing for me. You know, I was dating at the time. He, my husband was still playing and we were dating. We started trying to conceive because I had never been pregnant before. So it was a funny thing with him because I was just like, well, you know, we're going to do this. I need, I don't know if I can get pregnant. I've never been pregnant. And here he, he like, what? You ain't never been pregnant before. I'm like, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> And so, because I always tried, you know, preventing. I had never really been with anyone that I wanted to have a baby with, especially talking about out of wedlock. You know, that just I just didn't want to do that because of my own situation. And um, so when we started trying, you know, and it was failing, it was an insecure thing. It, like for me, because one, I'm older than my husband. I'm five and a half years older than my husband. So even though 40% of infertility is on the male side, I knew it was me and I carried that pressure. Hmm. And I, I just remember asking him like, what if I'm, what if, what if I'm not able to do this? Like what, what, what are we going to do if I'm not able to do it? Even though God has shown me my son, Richie, I knew that I was going to have a child. But then when we were getting to points where we would walk into some doctors and they'd be like, Oh, you know what? You don't even need to worry about this. Why don't you just get a donor? And I'm saying, wait a minute, what? We're not going to even try with, because for some IVF clinics, it's about the numbers for them. So they have to have successful pregnancies to add that to their stats. So why waste your try time with me on these high FSH when I could just get a donor and you know that's going to be a successful pregnancy? So I was dealing, I was up against all of these things and dealing with like, oh my God. So was this baby that you show me, God, was this from the egg of another woman? That's not the God I serve. And that's not what I knew. I just felt like that wasn't it. And so it wasn't that I was ready to give up. It's just I had to put into place, get myself together mentally, emotionally, and physically. Mm. Working on my health, changing my diet. Um, I found a Black RE. That is so, that was so important to me. And RE is a reproductive endocrinologist. They're only about, at the time when I was looking for one, there were only about 35 in the country. Now we have uh, about 60. So when people hear me throw out these stats, one thing you're going to learn about me in this, this season of Bell Collective, I'm all about my history. I'm all about my community. And when you have the first of anything for us, I'm going to applaud and I'm going to talk about it. And I just happen to have a couple of those first in my family. So I, I'm happy. I'm, I'm proud of that because those are the shoulders I stand on. And mm -hmm. my uh, RE, my reproductive endocrinologist, I actually had a live with her after the last episode. She's one of not that many. And so you also have to realize of African-American doctors in the country, we're still at about a 30% level. So I'm proud of, of, of the people that I'm around because I'm interacting with these type of people in my circle. So um, just with her, I began, once I found her, I built a trust in her because she wasn't saying to me what some of the other REs were saying. Like, you know, let's go ahead and go into a donor. She was saying, I'm going to work what you have. 
Now, everything they told you statistically is true. Your numbers are what they are. Those are facts. But I'm going to work with what you have. And that's just us understanding us. That's having a compassion and seeing the fear, the vulnerability, the emotion, and just physically drain and just mentally tired where she saw that I was because I, you know, for it, it was, I wanted to do it for my husband, but I wanted to, to see the promise that God had made to me. And so when she said that to me, I think the trust I had in her, and I told Willie when we left, I said, if Dr. Thompson says that it's not possible, then I'll believe it. And I went through a cycle with her and it wasn't a successful cycle. I only got one egg. It was fertilized. She said, you know what? Because normally when you go through a cycle, you go through this whole five day process or either you go even longer if you want to get it tested. A lot of times when I was getting those eggs, I was never getting, you know, people go in and they get 15, 30, 40, you know, all of these eggs. I was not, I would get one or two eggs after a, a retrieval. And this is surgery. I mean, this is a little minor surgery where you go in to get retrievals. And sometimes I wouldn't get anything. And this particular time with her, I got one. She fertilized it. Instead of waiting that five-day process, we waited two days. She put it right back in. She said, because for her, she's heard in her research that embryos do better, do better when they're in the mother's body. Well, we put it back in and it didn't take. So she came back and she said, Akeisha, before we go to drastic measures, I want to try one more time. I said, well, you know what, Dr. Thomas Thompson, um, I'm tired. I said, I need to take a break. And at that time, we were opening our bar in the Bronx. This was in two uh, 2019. And I just needed to focus on that because we were about a month away from opening. It was so much going on. And I said, you know what? I need to take a break. And then we were leaving. I, I was going to Essence. And she's just like, oh, girl, I'll be at Essence, too. So that I was like... Now, who, when your doctor's going to be at that, that's the doctor I need. Because she knew what Essence was, you know. And um, I said, okay, well, when I, we get back, then I'll start the process over. But I still had to go to her and do um, my blood work. That's another thing. People don't realize the wear and tear. Like, you're constantly, you're going in every day to get your blood drawn. I was getting, um, giving shots in my stomach. So my stomach was really bruised up. I have pictures of that. I can't really share because you see it, everything. I mean, we could probably blew her out. But I... I was just tired, Richie. And it was one of those things. And we were right before um, Father's Day. We opened our uh, restaurant. The soft opening was at June 6th. And, um, you know, my husband and I were going through the process. And uh, that Father's Day, I'll never forget this because one of Willie's old teammates had an event. And it was an event that his sister and his aunt were at. And they FaceTimed us. And we were just laying in the bed. We had just gotten up on this Father's Day. And he, um, she called and she said, hey, why aren't y'all at so-and-so's house? And I said, oh, I didn't know. And so I said, babe, did you know uh, they were having something? And he said, no. And so his aunt was just like, oh, it was a Father's Day thing. And um, I said, oh, okay. Well, we weren't offended because at this point, most of our friends had children. And sometimes I think they didn't know, they knew what we were going through because we were very transparent about what was happening with us, especially with our immediate circle. And um, I think some people like, well, do we invite them or we don't? You know, they know we'll come and have a good time. But I never was offended if somebody was having something for their kids or having something like that and we weren't invited. So Willie, he rolled back over and I told him, bye, I'll talk to you later. So I told Willie, I said, you know what, I'm going to get up and I'm going to make you a Father's Day breakfast because I know that um, you're going to be a father and you I'm going to make you this breakfast. And I got up and I went into what is now my kid's room. And it was going to be my nursery. But at the time, it was my war room. It was my prayer room. And Richie, I went in there. And when I tell you, I broke down. I mean, on my knees to God, just basically crying to him, like, if you want this for me, then do it. Because I am tired. You have shown me, my son. Now, he had not shown me my daughter, but he had shown me my son. I had seen my son's face. So I said, if you want it, then you do it because I am tired. And I have faith in you. I'm not tired of you, but I am believing and trusting you for what you said you were going to do. This will be Willie's last Father's Day without being a father, period. That was June 16, 2019. That was on a Sunday. We went to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. 
Friday, I was going back to Steph, uh, Dr. Thompson. She's my friend. She's one of my best friends now. So her name is Stephanie Thompson. I was going back to her office to start just to get blood work for that cycle because that was my 21st day. I didn't feel like going. I was just like, I do not want to go. I don't feel like starting this over. You can go 21 to 22. I said, I'll get up on Saturday. I'll go Saturday morning. I just don't want to go. Willie and I spent the day together. And when he was leaving, he was headed to the city to do some autograph session, something he had to do. And I didn't want to go. I said, go in there and get me a pregnancy test because you do have to take a pregnancy test before you start the stuff. And I just wanted to get that negative out the way, you know, because just to prepare myself mentally, like I know I'm getting ready to start a new cycle. Um, I, but I wasn't starting to cycle. I just needed to start that blood work. I said, so let me get that. So he's just like, why don't do that? I said, no, get it for me. He leaves, he heads to the city. I'm talking because I'm in Jersey, people who don't know what I'm saying. So we live in Jersey, going to the city is going into New York city. We live right across the, uh, across from New York city. So, um, I go in the bathroom and I said, you know what, let me go ahead and take this. And so I take it giving you TMI, pee on the stick. I sit it on the floor and I'm sitting on the toilet just like this, Bridget. <laughs> so I'm like, I look down at the thing and um, I'm I'm looking, <clears throat> I was like, uh. and well, I look up at the lights because in our bathroom, we have dimmers on them. Well, my husband, for whatever reason, like to set the mood when he in the bathroom. So they were dimmed down. So I'm thinking to myself like this on the toilet. I said, no, I have to do something about it. Lights, cause Willie, I said, hell, it almost looked like a positive on the test, and I'm still just sitting on the toilet. I get my tissue, I wipe myself, I put that down. So I pick the pregnancy test up, I sit it on the counter. I'm looking in the mirror, washing my hands, and I said, well, I, damn, so I'm really gonna have to get Dave. Dave is our groundskeeper. I'm gonna have to get him to do something about these lights, cause shit, it look like this. <laughs> oh. So then after I dried my hands off, I said, let me go in the dining room to God's light. Cause that's, I have a big window in my dining room. I said, let me look at this again. So I pick it up. I'm in here like the old lady who wear glasses. I said, this, damn, it looked like it's two lines on here. I screenshot it and then I sent it to Stephanie. So I put her name in all caps and I'm like, Stephanie, is this a positive? And she wrote back, hell yeah. I said, Lord, have mercy. Now, mind you, I had had nothing because I had just had a negative, you know, uh, failed cycle with her in May. So, I mean, we were, of course, I mean, this might, we doing it, you know, I mean, we grown and married, but you know, I, I yeah. wasn't thinking about anything. I'm thinking about opening our bar and we go in, but I didn't really get excited then because I had had seven miscarriages at this point. And every pregnancy that I had had failed. So I'm just like, okay, but I do call my husband because it was so it was so crazy to me. And I was like, babe, does this look positive? And he said, well, I see two lines. What's that mean? I said, that means it's saying pregnant. He was like, by who? Because this is how crazy, like how our mind was like, <laughs> wait, wait a minute, what? <laughs> like I said, what, what, what? And so I said, well, we're going to go to Stephanie because Stephanie said, come to me. I, I want to take your blood work. I just want to see if it's viable, like what your numbers are. I go in, lo and behold, anything over 25 is a pregnancy. My number was like 70. So she said, okay. She's like, you're definitely pregnant. She said, you know what? Come back on Monday. And if they doubled, then we'll know it's moving in the right direction. So I should have been in 140, you know, anywhere in the hundred. I go back in, I was at 298. She said, okay. So we gonna went through another week. She said, let's wait a week. That's Monday to Monday. That would have been getting me in that tricky period where I always lost between five and seven weeks. So it was going to be five weeks. She, we go in. Oh, my numbers had gone up to in the thousands. She's like, oh, wait a minute, I need to check to see if it's twins. Hold on. Let me see if it's two up in here. Because that's, I mean, they were just, and I was like, oh my God. So we were both leaving that weekend to head to New Orleans to go to Essence. And I was just, oh, I'm not, I don't want to go because- <laughs> You know, I know because, you know, I'm like, what if I lose? I, I mean, in my mind, then I'm going back to this fearful place. She said, no. She said, if you're going to lose and it's not a good pregnancy, you would lose anyway. We're not doing that. We're going to New Orleans. I will be there. If anything happens, you call me. Now, mind you, I'm still calling her Dr. Stephanie at this point because we were, you know, I was liking her, but we we had only been knowing each other two, two and a half, three months. What doctor you know is like, I'm going to be on vacation, but if you need anything, you call me and I, I, I'm coming over to you. And so I said, okay, 
we got to New Orleans. Of course, I was playing it careful, honey. I ain't do New Orleans like I used to do, you know, because I mean, New Orleans is only two hours from Jackson. So <laughs> I've been doing New Orleans in essence since I was 16. <laughs> so I just, I was very careful. I, you know, I had a great time. I saw Frankie Beverly's last performance there, but I was careful. So when we came back, from New Orleans, we went in and she started that ultrasound and I saw that and I said, oh my God, you did what you said you were gonna do. Wow. Now, so I don't, I mean, that can, this story can go on and on. I don't wanna take up this whole interview with that. But um, so yes, to God be the glory. Well, Akisha, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you. everything. You are a firecracker, and please don't ever change. Nah, I'm going to be 45 tomorrow. I, I, I mean, this is it, you know. Happy birthday. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you. But yes, don't ever change. Listen, we love it. It makes the show entertaining, and you have brought a whole new level of entertainment to season two of bell collector so we can't wait to see more yes thank you so much thank you for having me thank you absolutely can you tell people where they can follow everything akisha holly cologne yes well everything is at akisha holly uh on twitter on instagram and um on facebook is akisha holly cologne so if you put in akisha holly that's a-i-k-i-s-h-a -A, it's gonna come up there you go. Sky Squad, thank you so much for tuning in to this interview. Listen, we got a lot covered today, and we will definitely be checking back in with Miss Akisha. And don't forget to check out her merch as well. Yes, I don't please. Compete. I set standards. <laughs> Keep that in mind as you walk through this life, y'all. We will catch you guys in the next video.